We now start the first plenary session on the way the role of research and innovation in preserving and mobilizing cultural heritage in face of climate change. Please, I invite the first five speakers to join me on stage. Joanna Lisner, Giuseppina Padelletti, Catherine Warren, Frank McGovern, and Andrew Potts. Climate change and deterioration of the environment are key challenges. All aspects of our societies are under concern, and cultural heritage plays a major role. Both tangible and intangible, cultural heritage is more and more weakened and even destroyed by climate change. In that regard, heritage sciences are involved in the conceptions of new tools and methodologies to asset, prevent, and mitigate its impacts on monuments and enable their transmission for future generations. Both cultural heritage is uh, cultural heritage is both part of the solution and under concern. So we will wondering one on the one hand, what the effect of climate change on cultural heritage and what challenges does it pose to its safeguarding? On the other hand, how can heritage contribute to sustainable development? Which past adaptation strategy or traditional skills could help to improve their resilience of our societies? How can the knowledge and data from cultural heritage contribute to the study of past and present climate, but also to the emergence of the post carbon societies? How can we engage cultural heritage in the European Green Deal? To consider all these questions, we have the huge honor to receive five eminent experts on the topic. Please welcome Frank McGoran, Chief Specialist, Chief Climate Scientist at Environmental Protection Agency in Ireland, and Chair of the Joint Programming Initiative on Climate, which acts to align the development of climate change research in the European research area. Frank, you will have a joint speech with Catherine Warren, Vice Chair of the Joint Programming Initiative on Cultural Heritage and Global Change. You are also Head of History, Heritage, Languages and Literature at the Arts and Humanities Research Council in United Kingdom. Then we will listen to Joanna Liesner, Chair of the EU Open Method Coordination Group, Cultural Heritage Resilience for Climate Change, member of the EU Expert Group on Cultural Heritage, the German Research Alliance Cultural Heritage, and the Fraunhofer Sustainability Network. At the end, as the coordinator of the Climate Change Network, hosted by the Paris International Council on Monuments and Sites, ECOMOS, Andrew Potts, will show us how cultural operators can scale up the approach of climate change challenges. And at last but not least, Giuseppina Padelletti, Research Director of the National Council of Research in Italy, will present to us the European project Heracles. Please, Frank and Catherine, I give you the floor. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for that warm welcome. It is a privilege to be speaking to you all here today. We'll be presenting a collaboration between the Joint Programming Initiative on Cultural Heritage and the Joint Programming Initiative on Climate, which has led to the publication of a joint white paper that we will be launching today. Sorry, the slides, there we go. So firstly, what are joint programming initiatives? These are a concept introduced by the European Commission in 2008 to address societal challenges that no country or region could tackle alone. 
They're member state initiatives bringing together national research funding organisations, ministries and research councils in Europe and beyond. Countries voluntarily agree to work in partnership towards common visions encapsulated in strategic research and innovation agendas and implemented through joint activities such as joint calls, knowledge hubs and task forces. They aim to successfully implement the European research area by aligning research and innovation investments spent at a national level and preventing duplication and fragmentation for better use of EU member states and associated countries' public R&I resources. There are currently 10 JPIs in Europe addressing societal challenges, including the two that we are representing today on cultural heritage and global change and climate. The JPI on cultural heritage and, and cultural heritage and global change was launched in 2011 and brings together 17 countries in Europe. Its main objective is to promote the safeguarding of cultural heritage and enhance its sustainability through coordinated research and innovation. The JPICH pr promotes a holistic approach to cultural heritage, which includes tangible, intangible, digital and natural assets. It is currently coordinated by the French Ministry of Culture with the support of the Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation and the funding agency, the National Research Agency. In 2020, informed by a consultation exercise carried out across our partner countries and with our scientific committee, the JPICH published a new strategic research and innovation agenda, which had four priority areas a reflective heritage for a resilient society, sustainable management of cultural heritage, cultural heritage in a changing context, and cultural heritage facing climate and environmental change. And this was further broken down into two sub-themes, measuring and responding to the impact of climate and environmental change on cultural and natural heritage, and cultural and natural heritage as resources for sustainable development. And it was the importance of research on cultural heritage and climate that was the most common theme to come through our consultation exercise. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Frank McGovern from JPI Climate. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here on behalf of JPI Climate uh, and what I want to do is just show you some. Oh, can you put that? Yes. <clears throat> JPI Climate, or Connecting Climate Knowledge for Europe, is a consortium of a number of European countries, which are shown on the screen here. Our vision is enabling transition to a low emission, climate resilient economy, society, and environment. Our mission is to provide climate knowledge to inform the implementation of the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals and European climate policies. Our operations are to connect research performers, funders to promote the creation of new knowledge. And since its establishment in 2011, JPI Climate has mobilized more than 120 million euro in pan-European investments in climate change research. JPI climate strategic priorities are to accelerate the development and communication of knowledge to policy and practitioners. And obviously we see the links in what we're doing to the European Green Deal, the climate law and the EU missions. All of these have to work together in a, in a structured uh, manner to achieve their goals. Our key pillars are achievement of climate resilience, achieving climate neutrality and managing the essential transition and transformation which we face. Examples we have already is a joint knowledge hub on sea level rise, which is established with our colleagues in JPI Oceans. Sea level rise is one of the key threats around the world, not only for small island states, but all coastal countries and coastal cities. We have established a knowledge hub on climate neutrality, 
which aims to bring together the information from diverse sources to enable us to communicate the solutions to policymakers and practitioners. Through the European Climate Change Adaptation Conference, ECHA, we will bring together scientists, policymakers, and those actors who are at the forefront of making Europe climate resilient, climate resilient. And that will work closely with the EU adaptation mission. And the next uh, ECHA conference will be 2023. We collaborate with other JPIs, including obviously JPI Culture and Heritage and beyond through the Belmont Forum. We have and will hope to maintain strategic support from the European Commission. I will hand back to Matt. So recognising common interests and synergies, both JPIs met several times in 2019 to investigate areas of shared interest and to develop common activities. In September 2020, a joint workshop on cultural heritage and climate change, attended by around 70 experts, was organised to identify joint priority research themes and gaps, and to discuss the role of the JPIs in addressing these. Ten key messages were identified and outlined in the workshop summary, and these were the starting point for our joint white paper. The workshop summary and its recommendations were welcomed by the governing boards of both JPIs, which approved the development of a joint white paper. They also agreed to explore the potential of a joint funding pool with the aim of funding innovative policy relevant research. Since March 2021, the two JPIs have been working to develop the joint white paper. A dedicated joint task force and a white paper working group was set up, composed of 20 experts from nine countries, both within Europe and beyond. The white paper is addressed to policymakers, researchers and research funding bodies. Today marks the launch of our white paper, and as of this morning, it should now be available on the JPICH's Heritage Research Hub um, for download. So the objectives of the white paper were to scope research gaps and opportunities at the interface of cultural heritage and climate change, to support the two JPIs to generate policy relevant research outcomes, to raise awareness, promote transdisciplinary research and greater collaboration between heritage and climate research communities, and to complement parallel initiatives aiming to further engage cultural heritage in climate action. The document includes a short state of the art of research in the field of cultural heritage and climate change, key research gaps and priorities requiring attention in the coming years, and a list of actions and instruments that both JPIs could implement to support research and innovation that informs policy. And this is the, the image that will be on the front of the white paper. So when you see the, the document, it's this, this image of Bergen in Norway that will, will greet you. So as I said, the, the white paper starts with an overview of the, the existing state of the art um, and a review of existing literature discovered that research on individual geopolitical regions or a few in the immediate vicinity of one another remains prevalent. So there is an opportunity here to stimulate research and knowledge exchange that cross cuts several regions. Geographically disparate regions may present common challenges and opportunities that are worth exploring. Quantitative and qualitative research methods remain siloed in their applications. Mixed methods, which often support a cross-disciplinary approach, are more likely to be found in policy publications. There's a need for deeper understanding of culture and heritage as embedded in their socio-environmental context to inform policy. This includes considering the role of traditional and local knowledge, as well as learning from the past. The ecological and social impacts related to losses and opportunities for cultural assets and values from adaptation and mitigation need to be researched more intensively. So the white paper sets out a number of research gaps and priorities under five different themes. And these are addressing the climate emergency, 
strengthening the commitment of the cultural heritage sector to address the climate emergency. The impacts of climate change, predicting and assessing the impacts of climate change on and through cultural heritage. Protecting cultural heritage, building protection and adaptation strategies for cultural heritage. Contributing to climate adaptation, assessing the potential of cultural heritage to inform the development of, culture, of climate adaptation. And cultural heritage as a resource, investigating how cultural heritage can support societal transformations and be a resource for climate mitigation and sustainable futures. I'd now like to welcome Frank back to, to finish the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, the white paper sets out potential instruments and tools to support its implementation. One instrument that we've already foreseen is a call, a joint call in 20, 2023. We're taking the next steps on this and already exploring options to include partners from outside of Europe. As I said, we, we do have contacts with groups such as the Belmont Forum. The other instruments and tools include networking and capacity building, joint monitoring, evaluation, and learning exercises, joint knowledge products, e.g. briefs, articles, and videos, and as I mentioned, knowledge hubs. Our aim is to support the implementation of national, European, and international processes and policies. Examples include, obviously, the Paris Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, the European Green Deal, the European Climate Law, the European Adaptation Strategy, the EU Mission on Adaptation to Climate Change, the new European Bauhaus, and regionals and national, and importantly, local actions, because actions have to take place locally to be effective. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, Joanna Liesner, it's your turn. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, bonjour à tous. No, um, good morning. congratulate our French colleagues for this timely and very important conference about the future of our heritage, about the role of science and research to protect cultural heritage. As it was already mentioned by many of the speakers before me, while we are convening here in this fantastic environment in the Louvre, a terrible war is going on amidst Europe. It is a war about truth. It is a war about who is telling the truth. But what can give us answers? An answer can be found in our cultural heritage. It is in our archives. It is in our libraries. It is in our paintings. It is in our monuments. It is in our, the answers lie in our battlegrounds and sadly in our cemeteries. But these testimonies of truth are under severe attack, not only by the war which is going on right now, but also by an unprecedented speed and scale of climate change. And here, Europe plays an important role. As Commissioner Gabriel has said, and the Member of Parliament, Mr. Ela, has said, Europe takes care of our cultural heritage to fight together against climate change and to protect cultural heritage in crisis. 
This is why in October 2020, the Council of the European Union has given a mandate to the member states to set up an expert group. And this is the first time that this topic has received a political mandate. So the task for this expert group called OMC, Open Method of Coordination, I will come to it back later, is to examine the current and emerging threats and impacts of climate change. We have to identify and exchange good practices. That is very important to know also some positive examples, how we can fight against climate change. We have to examine what are the contributions climate uh, cultural heritage can make to mitigate and to adapt to climate change. And very important also is awareness raising. This is why we are here together today. It is to raise awareness about the topic that cultural heritage is threatened by climate change. And it is about capacity building. We need the people, we need the skills. And at the end of the work, which is still work in progress of our group, is we can produce recommendations, recommendations for discussions and planning uh, at European and national level. But before, no, I think I left out, but doesn't matter. This um, EU OMC group, OMC Open Method of Coordination, means that it is up to the member states whether they think this topic is important or not, that they send delegates. And as you can see, we have 28 participating countries, 25 from the European Union and three countries, associated countries. And this high number of 28 delegates already shows that the topic is very important also on the national level. Let us have a short look back about the role of research. Research is indispensable to shape policies, to arrive at actions. I want to mention that nearly 200 years ago, it was the French scientist Jean-Baptiste Fourier who discovered that the atmosphere of our planet is acting as a greenhouse. Without this greenhouse effect, we would not be able to live here on this planet. And it took more than 150 years to uh, the establishment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And again, I would like to highlight the important role Europe is playing here. In 2003, it was DG Research of the European Commission who launched the first call to look scientifically into the impacts of climate change on cultural heritage. And since then, this topic has received much more attention. And in 2021, it was the setup then again of the European Expert Group on Climate Change and Cultural Heritage. And also it was the year where climate research received the Nobel Prize. In 2022, this year, we want to finalize our report and the, and the recommendations. But coming back to the work of our OMC group, the mandate is vast and extensive. We had first to design a questionnaire. We wanted to know what is the state of play in the member states. We wanted to know how, what do you think are the most important threats to cultural heritage and also to collect best practice and good practice examples. And here you can see the situation of cultural heritage and climate change in policies. You can see that there are still a lot of member states where cultural heritage is not at all mentioned or addressed in climate change policies. And we found out that it is also an obstacle that the different ministries responsible for heritage and for climate change are not uh, well cooperating yet. So there is a big obstacle because it is divided. And some countries did not give any um, answer at all. No, it was only one. And there are also, of course, a lot of countries where cultural heritage is mentioned in climate change policies. 
What were the answers from our experts? What are the threats, do you think, from um, climate change to cultural heritage? And it is quite evident that the most important threats are coming from extreme climate events, but also the indirect impacts of climate change, socioeconomic uh, impacts were ranked very high. A little less was ranked gradual climate change and also uh, the increase of pests and other biological species. What did you think that uh, the risk potential by type of heritage, also here again, buildings and monuments, but less addressed was the movable heritage as we have it here in the museums. And our biggest task was really to find these good practice examples from the member states. It was a very, very difficult task to find these examples because we didn't know whom shall we address, where we can find all this information. But now, after one year of working together, we found 83 good practice examples. And this can serve as a source of inspiration and for upscaling. I only want to show two examples from our 83 examples. One is from France. It is from the city of Bordeaux. And that shows that, that we need not only research, but also regulation. We need stable conditions, regulations, and laws to protect cultural heritage in times of climate change. And we also need to invest into measures which don't use any energy. And here you can see this fantastic example from Vienna, where they invested into an old air, um, air well system. Yeah, what is the summary of our work so far? We are not yet at the end. But the most important message is that research is an indispensable driver to protect cultural heritage from climate change. Most of our 83 examples were stimulated and initiated by research projects. And we have a lot of gaps. We still don't know the scale uh, of how much our heritage is at risk. We need a European heritage risk assessment map. We still have lack of data. What are the costs lying ahead of us? How much money do we need to adapt and to mitigate our cultural heritage in times of climate change? We need to enhance the cooperation at all levels, on all levels between cultural heritage scientists and climate scientists, between the different ministries, between the different levels on national, EU and local and regional. And we have to invest into skills and capacity building in order to keep these testimonies of truth in these terrible times of war and in the terrible times of climate change. Thank you very much. I wish you a fruitful discussion and a good conference here, and we hope that this war will end very soon. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you so much, Joanna. Please, Andrew Patz. Madame and Monsieur, Excellencies, colleagues. Uh. The Climate Heritage Network, it's an international network of universities, public bodies, civil society, who have come together to cooperate on mobilizing arts, culture, and heritage for climate action. I work for ECOMOS, which is based in Paris. ECOMOS serves as the secretariat for the Climate Heritage Network. I also bring to you greetings from Sneska Kwadbelek Mihailovic of Europa Nostra, who serves as the European co-chair of the CHN. It's my pleasure to be included in this conference on the topic of heritage for the future, although I acknowledge that it is a challenging topic when juxtaposed against the existential threat posed by the climate emergency and the issues of intergenerational equity that that threat raises. As you heard from Sarah at the beginning of our panel, this climate change discussion is meant to explore both adapting heritage to the impacts of climate change 
and also cultural heritage as a resource for mitigating climate change, which is to say, reducing greenhouse gases. I'm very glad of this because both of these dimensions are crucial. And we heard this from my friend, Johanna Leisner as well. Humans have already warmed the planet over one degree Celsius since pre-industrial levels. We must adapt to the impacts of the climate change that we have already caused. But let's be clear, things will get worse. If your job is safeguarding cultural heritage, what climate impacts should you plan for? How many meters of sea level rise should you expect? How many days where the temperature is over 40 degrees Celsius should you plan for? Of course, the answers to these questions depend on how much we continue to warm the planet, which in turn is a function of the success or failure of greenhouse gas reductions of the European Green Deal of the Paris Agreement. According to the UN Environment Program, the 2021 Emissions Gap Report, the world is dangerously off course to meeting the Paris Agreement's mitigation target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions enough to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We know from downscaled climate models that in situ conservation of many heritage sites will not be possible at these rates of warming. The idea that every place can adapt to two degrees of warming, let alone three degrees of warming, this is fantasy. That is why the current draft of the new UNESCO World Heritage Policy on climate change says that the implementation of a precautionary approach that pursues pathways limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius with no overshoot is the most effective approach for the protection, conservation, and management of cultural and natural heritage. And so all this underscores why the heritage research agenda must address both adaptation and mitigation. And in my opinion, it should do so equally. So I think the climate environment theme of this conference is asking the right questions. But what are the answers to these questions? For these, I think we must also look at the other three themes of this conference because climate change touches them all. The theme on cultural heritage in a changing context is clearly relevant, but also the theme on a reflective heritage for a resilient society. Heritage reflects the society that we have and our society and culture, at least in industrialized nations, caused anthropogenic climate change. Cultural heritage is thus part of the solution. I'm going to call it the response to climate change, but it is also part of the problem. Addressing this conundrum, in my opinion, should be at the heart of the heritage research and innovation agenda. Let's start with the idea of cultural heritage as part of the response to climate change. Isaac Stoddard at Uppsala University in Sweden and colleagues released an influential article late last year, just before COP26, that looked at why, after 30 years of trying, we have still failed to bend the greenhouse gas emissions curve. They argue that we suffer from an epistemological monoculture that impoverishes the global capacity to imagine forms of living not wedded to the carbon economy. I strongly believe that culture and heritage can help find the social imaginaries for circular, regenerative, non-extractive, sustainable ways of living. Traditional knowledge of buildings, land use, agriculture that predate or work independently of the fossil fuel era can point the way to post-carbon living. Artistic and imaginative tools hold the potential to challenge business as usual mindsets. But dear colleagues, how do we release this potential? To be honest, I think we do not fully know. I think this is a gap in our understanding. I know in heritage, for example, we love to say that traditional knowledge, indigenous wisdom, these can solve climate change. And I agree. The worldviews held by indigenous peoples and local communities, especially those that were never co-opted by modern take, make, waste approaches, offer compelling counterpoints to prevailing unsustainable paradigms of development and so-called progress. 
But where is this working in practice? Which municipalities, which national governments have included traditional knowledge-based strategies in their nationally determined contributions in their climate action plans? Where is traditional knowledge valorized in climate planning? Remember what Greta Thunberg uh, called politicians' words that sound great, but so far have led to no climate action? She called it blah, blah, blah. We have to make sure that our discussion and cultural heritage, our rhetoric of topics like climate action and traditional knowledge do not end up being blah, blah, blah. Of course, valorizing traditional knowledge can lead to meaningful climate action, but how? Extractive approaches that view bits of traditional knowledge in isolation will not work. Better is rooting our work in a cultural rights perspective that centers the struggle against cultural extinction from climate impacts and which holistically supports indigenous peoples, local communities, and the cultural landscapes that have sustained them and their knowledge, linking culture to climate, gender, and racial justice. So we must understand how to effectively valorize emphasize cultural heritage as part of the climate solution, unlocking heritage information as well as imaginative tools to support transformative reinterpretation of today's carbon scapes, our peri-urban, our suburban carbon-driven landscapes that we inhabit now, and the make-take-waste petrocultures that produce them. The flip side of this coin is how do we approach the conservation of these carbon scapes, of the elements of our culture, of our heritage that have given us climate change. We are now 200 years more into the industrial revolution. Many lifestyles and values that we engage in are deeply entangled with fossil fuels and extractive and colonial systems. How do we conserve this heritage? One approach already being pursued is to frame this heritage as toxic heritage, toxic heritage. This offers counter narratives, helping people see the connections between places, environmental harm, and systemic inequality. This approach finds echoes in work to document and contextualize the heritage of human slavery. Consider the current contestation over monuments to slave traders and slave owners. I suggest to you that in the near future, we will see equal contestation over the legacy of coal, oil, and plastic the heritage of climate change. We must also dismantle approaches that embed cultural heritage in greenhouse gas intensive business as usual economic models. And this includes some approaches to creative industries and cultural tourism. Doing these things means joining up heritage research to climate science. And here I want to flag the international co-sponsored meeting on culture, heritage and climate change the first scientific conference on cultural heritage sponsored by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was held in December. In conclusion, earlier this month, as you heard, the IPCC released its new report on the current and future climate impacts, and the findings were grim. UN Secretary General Guterres called it an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. How do we account for this great failing of climate leadership. One growing critique holds that prevailing models of climate planning are falling short because they fixate on large scale technological and market based solutions and miss factors less easy to quantify the socioeconomic context of the climate crisis. They miss demand side, people centered, place based approaches. They miss culture. Culture and heritage are increasingly understood as the whole in climate action. And filling this hole should be the aim, at least an aim, of the European Heritage Research and Innovation Agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Zepina. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. <clears throat> I'm really honored to be here and I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation to join this very important initiative. Indeed, it is not easy to talk about uh, cultural heritage, these beautiful things and objects, 
during uh, <clears throat> a war is going on in, in, in Europe. Anyway, I am here to talk about the Heracles project funded by um, Horizon 2020, dealing with resilience of cultural heritage against the effects of climate change. The primer is the National Council of Research of Italy, and the consortium brought together big companies, small medium enterprises, research institutions, academies, nonprofit organizations, and last but not least, the end users so that we are part of the consortium. And also, uh, it has to be underlined the presence of ministries and superintendencies in the advisory board of the project. So the Heracles target are conservators, municipalities, town planners, government agencies and companies in general, all those responsible for cultural heritage and involved in its protection. Here are listed just some treats from climate change endangering a cultural heritage asset. They create structural instability, material degradation, corrosion, among others, uh, endangering the asset themselves. So when a budget constrain limit mitigation strategies, it is uh, really important to have tools, methodologies for defining priorities and supporting decision on the action to undertake. And I mean informed decision for cost-effective preventive maintenance and conservation actions. And so Heracles project focused and contributed exactly on these aspects, not on the emergency side, let me say. Our case studies were in Greece and in Italy. In Greece, we considered the effect of the sea level rise and the correlation, the correlated extreme weather phenomena. In Italy, instead, we addressed the problem faced by historical center uh, and buildings due to hydrogeological risk worsened by the heavy rains caused by climate change. Uh, the, the, the Italian town, Gubbio, is moreover located in the Apennini chain, a seismic area, and we will see in a while the further implication of this. Uh, just uh, uh, let me stress another choice we did, probably in counter trend, to choose historical minor, minor centers that are enriching the European heritage in every nation and that we are conceived in the past with a, a climate condition very different from nowadays and now they suffer not being adequate for some aspect to face the changes. Based on the end user requirements and on investigation we uh, made on site, we started from this important uh, part, it was clear the importance to have available an integrated monitoring technologies approach and expertise. Heracles then proposed the integration of a wide area surveillance from satellite, including asset and surrounding territory, till the observation on site of the single element of the asset. I think that this is the, uh, our um, innovative and pioneering approach. So let's see. Uh, an example of what we have uh, achieved uh, using this approach. Uh, due to limit on time, we, uh, I show to you only a brief part on Italy. So we start from the satellite observation using maps of displacement in time that are providing timely and accurate geospatial information. Uh, I mean, they can indicate structural failures of historical buildings, as well as terrain deformation in the surrounding area. We zoom now to uh, the Gubbio area <clears throat> and to the Consoli Palace itself. You can see the area of the palace marked with the points of different color. 
uh, they are indicating, uh, they are uh, made through algorithms and are indicating displacement that, that can uh, go in different uh, opposite direction with respect to the zero line that is the green color. So major in theory, major criticalities are found when two parts of a building presents very opposite color, I mean red and blue. In this case, no major concern we are found, uh, you can see. Nevertheless, a, a crack was uh, found on this facade, with a, is indicated with a, the red arrow, and um, to fully understand what is going on, we applied also the integrated approach uh, positioning in situ sensing for, for, to monitor the crack and to assess the effect of the climate changes, the behavior of the, of the crack amplitude was correlated with the variation in temperature daily and seasonally. It was found that the crack opens in winter due to the thermal coefficient of the stone and the opposite happens in summer. So it is a cyclic coherent behavior per se not critical at the moment. But there is a, a concern. Uh, in fact, on the, basic, um, on the basis of historical data, it was possible to acquire info on the opening extent since 2011. And uh, you can follow only the green line that is related to the differences, the opening of the crack. So uh, it can see that unfortunately, um, seismic events occurred in this area also during the Heracles project lifetime, and they are acting as a risk multiplier, producing cascade effects. And due to that, the opening, uh, you can see uh, toward the, the right side, the opening increased by a factor of five, and there is no way to come back to the previous uh, situation. This is just an example of what we can observe, acquire and understand and provide useful info which must be known by the decision makers responsible for the asset for planning mitigation actions. Climate change affects structure stability also through material degradation phenomena that is amplified by climate change, as can be seen from these images of the town walls. In this case, we face the weathering issue concerning materials, in particular mortars, that are an important role in consolidating a masonry. And in fact, in this case, we designed and realized the new material mortars, uh, in the, uh, of course, uh, offering a tailored solution to solve uh, different issues. So we, de um, we developed the different types, offering different performances. And we did that also um, taking into account traditional skills. Um, having in advance such kind of information is clearly crucial, for instance, to avoid or to mitigate events such as those reported here that occurred at Volterra in 2014 due to heavy rains, due to uh, and hydrological risk. You see that the people living on the house open the door and are directly on the chasm. And also probably a sort of um, preventive effect can be done also on the wall of an orchard that undergone a seismic event. In conclusion, for the integration, from the integration of multi-risk, multi-source and multi-scale data, it is possible to obtain useful information and solution to be made available for end user, manager of, G, of cultural heritage asset. And uh, uh, the approach and the tools we um, we realized are flexible and guarantee a general applicability. That means that can be transferred and applied to other sites and assets with other problems. In this sense, general protocols were proposed as well as general actions to be undertaken as a preventive measure and a remediation action.
Of course, uh, we tested our approach and methodology on a specific sites, but easily it can be transferred from global, from local to global. Here are the fundamental steps to follow for identifying the critical areas, correlating the effect to causes, and gaining awareness and forecasting the effects. So I hope that it was demonstrated how much science and technology can positively contribute at present to the challenge that cultural heritage, our past, is facing with the aim to be maintained for our future. Um, I would like to close with the word of Carlo Levi, an Italian writer that was saying that the future has an ancient heart. Thank you for your kind attention. Well, thank you to all of you for your captivating lectures and the tools and solutions you presented to us in, uh, to face that challenge. I would like now to have small talks with you. You all emphasize uh, the way uh, cultural heritage not could be, but is threatened by climate change. But may I ask you to what extent cultural stakeholders grasp climate change issues in their everyday work? I mean, do they aware of the impact of climate change on the monuments? Take that. We have gathered some information that the situation is changing now slightly to the better, but still we know from an investigation in Germany that uh, many of the people dealing with cultural heritage are not yet fully aware that climate change poses such a risk on cultural heritage, especially in museums for also for movable heritage. Yes, yeah. I completely agree with what uh, Joanna is uh, saying. Uh, I think that they are not completely aware, but it, it is also true from our experience that in the cases uh, when you collaborate strictly with, with them, um, it is easy to, to make uh, understandable that uh, this, this problem is under our eyes and uh, is um, and then during a lot uh, um, the cultural heritage asset. I think that anyway that uh, climate change impact should uh, become a, a baseline of competencies of, uh, of heritage competencies because uh, it's time, <laughs> it's even uh, late, <laughs> let me see. And uh, do, do you share the same experience in Ireland, United Kingdom or? Yes. Uh, I, I, well, I think just to say from a personal perspective, I think really this um, this is an important area that has been neglected in the past, and we really have to take forward attention to the uh, impacts on culture and heritage of climate change. Uh, for me personally, when uh, my colleagues from JPI Culture and Heritage came to Dublin to discuss our shared interests, it was a window opening because really I have worked in climate for many years, many years too many years really, but uh, we had not really had that discussion. Uh, and it happened when just as in, in, in April 2019, when Notre Dame mm -hmm. had just been um, subject to terrible fire. And I think that brought home the fact that these monuments to our history are also vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And what seems strong and permanent is not. Mm -hmm. And really, it's a witness to our history. And what is also part of our heritage that it has witnessed our, our culture and we want to pass it on to the future. So for me, it is really important that we bring this conversation into the climate arena, mm -hmm. because it gives us an avenue to discuss 
what is important for people because we saw what happened in Notre Dame. It was distress here in Paris, in France, but also across Europe and around the world. Of course. And we see, again, the terrible devastation that's happening in Ukraine at the moment. And it is that shadow, these dark forces that we're dealing with that are threatening our humanity, really, and our future. And whether we, we have no choice but to act. We cannot continue to desecrate our geological, the planet's geological heritage, because that is what we're doing for profit at the risk of our future. And you, you asked me specifically in Ireland, in Ireland, we're losing monuments that have stood for centuries because of increased erosion, uh, extreme events. And we have put in place some strategies to manage that, but we need more. And we need to share our experience of how to do that uh, with everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Catherine, do you want to add something? Sure. Well, first yeah, of all, I completely agree with what Frank just said at the Climate Heritage Network. We say that we want to have a conversation about climate with culture colleagues, and we want to have a com uh, conversation ab about culture with climate colleagues. Uh, and so both of these are critical. In the United States, there was a study done of cultural heritage professionals asking them what they felt like the barriers were to engaging more with the topic of climate change. And the number one answer given was uh, the the culture professionals felt like they lacked expertise and didn't have access to climate science information. The second one was a lack of professional standards about how a person in their position should be engaging. And so now we increasingly see national monument commissions, ministries of culture around the world that have climate scientists on staff. And I think this is a step in the right direction. The, the last thing I will say is uh, in 2019, ECOMOS issued a report called The Future of Our Pasts, Engaging Cultural Heritage in Climate Action. And one recommendation it made was that access to downscaled climate models should be a baseline competency for every manager of collections, libraries, heritage sites. And it's incredibly eye-opening when managers have access to this information because first they see the humidity, the, the change in humidity and temperature, in heat, in aridity that will affect their own collections. But lastly, secondly, they see how changeable, how variable it is depending on the success of the Paris Agreement, depending on how much warming we have. And they instantly become very invested in the success of climate action. So these types of steps, I think, help. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think all of this shows the, the need for collaboration, which is what we're trying to achieve with our collaboration with JPI Climate is this isn't just an issue for cultural heritage researchers. It's not just an issue for climate scientists that we need to enable people to come together to carry out transdisciplinary research projects and to think of this as a, a global problem that, that we need to address together um, and move away from thinking about sort of single a single focus on a particular country or region and think about how we can come together to collaborate to really move things forward and to inform policymakers and to think about how we inform both national and, and international policy to really make a difference well thank you uh, we are in a european symposium so i would like to ask you how might a european initiatives and policy be more the more responsive to the effects of climate change on heritage and to promote heritage resiliency <laughs> Well, I think it is uh, the duty of the European Union, as it was outlined by uh, Commissioner Gabriel and also by Member of Parliament, Mr. Ehler. Um, it is uh, in our Treaty of Lisbon, but when we look, for example, to the Green Deal, when it was presented in 2019, there was not one single word mentioning cultural heritage. So whenever it comes to the bigger policies, uh, Green Deal or financial instruments, uh, heritage is often forgotten. It is not, let's say, at the highest political level when it comes to finances, taxes, 
eco economics. The same happens also on national level. And we have asked our members in the OMC group um, how often is heritage in the policies mentioned. And there are still a lot of gaps. Sometimes it, heritage is mentioned, but only with a word that doesn't mean anything. And uh, heritage is always seen as something is very beautiful, but uh, not often really that it is a pillar of our society, the pillar of truth, the pillar how we can manage our future. And here I think we have to implement much stronger heritage also in the recovery and resilience plans of many countries so that um, money is really attributed to adapt and to mitigate our heritage. Thank you. Yes, of course. <laughs> there is always uh, no, the, also the problem to find when we see at the European uh, call uh, now where the cultural heritage uh, area is located is not so made put in priority. Uh, it has also said that uh, <laughs> to be practical in, in, in Europe, the huge number and diversity of the cultural heritage and asset uh, probably is making uh, difficult to, um, to, I don't know, to create, is creating a very complex uh, scenario that is not uh, easy to, to summarize. But I think that uh, initiatives at the national level and the European, as you did, the work of the, of the group leading um, where Joanna that is representing are very important because we need to, to share uh, the best practice, uh, the, the, our ideas and innovation to, to show that it is possible to, to push at um, policy level much more these uh, <clears throat> topics and actions. And then. Yeah, well, it, it needs a number of um, elements. Um, obviously, you need the enabling environment. You need to have the understanding, the scientific understanding. You need to have the, 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 the sense of importance of the, the, the key issues. And that has to be, I must say, it has to be, you can have all the strategies and deals, but you really need legislation. And the legislation has to provide the impetus for policy, because otherwise policy can be very ethereal, it can just disappear. And until you have it actually effectively in legislation, uh, you'll find the systems don't re respond properly. And the systems, once they are pushed, they will respond, and then they will seek the knowledge that they will uh, require to protect culture and heritage. And I'm speaking for experience, because that is what happened in Ireland. And until we had the legislation in place, we had a lot of fine words, but only actions after the legislation. I uh, agree very much with what Johanna said, so I won't add very much, just two, uh, two um, resources that expand on what Johanna said. The first is to mention the existence of a document called the European Cultural Heritage Green Paper that was issued by Europa Nostra and ECOMOS with the support of the European Investment Bank Institute. It was a response to uh, the fact that cultural heritage was missing from the European Green Deal. And it goes through uh, seven key chapters of the European Green Deal, farm to fork, circular economy, renovation wave, mobility, and outlines how cultural heritage can contribute to achieving those ambitions. So I think it's a good resource. Johanna was an expert advisor to this project. Um, and second, um, it's been mentioned already that cultural heritage is missing from very many climate plans. And, and this is a, a gap in climate planning, but also the process of filling that gap, the relationships that have to be built, the uh, interdisciplinarity to get cultural heritage added to national adaptation plans, for example, is very valuable. So I would encourage people to take up that cause. And in this past June, um, when the G20 met under the Italian presidency, it was the first ever meeting of the ministers of culture of the G20. And they issued a joint statement calling for cultural heritage to be added to national adaptation communications. And so I encourage you to take up their call, uh, remind your minister of that and achieve the inclusion of cultural heritage into your national adaptation communication in your country. Yeah, thank you. Catherine, do you want to add something? 
Yeah, no, I agree with everything that's been said so far. And I think it's also important for us to think about beyond Europe. So we're, we're here representing European initiatives and organizations, but we need to think about this, as I said, as a global, global issue. And so we're thinking about how we can collaborate beyond Europe and think about how we can ensure that the, the highest quality research and innovation is undertaken, thinking about this as a, a global issue. Um, and so I think that's something that we as the two JPIs are thinking about how we go beyond Europe. And I think there would be benefit in, in also thinking about that from the European Commission in, in sort of moving beyond funding just for European initiatives and thinking about how we take that further. Well, I thank you, each of you, for attending and for contributing for that important event on a great challenge. Maintenant, je vais vous laisser aller à une pause. No, I'm going to uh, let you take a coffee break. And uh, if you're in the room, you'll be able to leave the auditorium. We have a cup of coffee waiting for you. If you are watching online, we'll be back at 12.15 as we resume. We will move on to... Um, a discussion regarding the um, heritage science and digital transformation challenges and opportunities. If you are in the room, please keep your headset with you um, uh, during the coffee break. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll be back soon.